Thanks, Jodome, for joining us this hour. Happy to have you here. Um, and, you know, this is one of those days. I have to tell you, honestly, it's getting to be a little bit nuts. This time last night, we were working on the story of the Trump administration having nominated someone to be Secretary of Defense, despite the fact that that nominee was trying to keep secret a bloody and terrible domestic violence situation in his family. One that was known to police, it was starting to be investigated by the FBI, but that nominee was just hoping he'd be able to keep it secret anyway and maybe it wouldn't come out and he'd be able to become the confirmed Secretary of Defense and nobody would know, right? It is amazing enough that the White House had been reckless enough to put somebody who was in that kind of a compromised position at the Pentagon at all as acting defense secretary for six months, let alone that they nominated him to try to confirm him for that position on a permanent basis. I mean, it's whatever you think about the circumstances of what had happened in his family, the fact that he was trying to keep it secret. I mean, that's the danger, right? That's the potential liability to blackmail or somebody trying to leverage that secret against him while he's running the Defense Department. It emerged after USA Today and then the Washington Post broke that story yesterday and Patrick Shanahan withdrew his nomination for, to, to be Defense Secretary. It, it emerged that U.S. Senators on the Armed Services Committee were especially aggrieved that they had never been notified about that very serious situation in Shanahan's background that he was trying to keep under wraps. Senators were angry because Shanahan had gone through the Senate confirmation process actually for a lower level job at the Defense Department in 2017. As part of that confirmation process, the administration should have turned over vetting materials and background check information that provided senators with that kind of information about that nominee before they held his confirmation hearings and voted on him. So, I mean, in, in the Patrick Shanahan baseball bat beating grim history involving his wife and his son and his own involvement after the fact and trying to manage the consequences of that crime, I mean, when that all came out yesterday, senators were mad that they were learning about that like all the rest of us were for the first time in the pages of the Washington Post. They were mad about that because they had just gone through Senate confirmation with that guy as a nominee the previous year and none of that stuff had ever been flagged for them. So that's what we were working our way through uh, in terms of the news this time last night. That was just yesterday. Well, now I see your uh, acting Secretary of Defense vetting disaster conflagration, and I raise you Vice President Pence's National Security Advisor. Okay, um, this is Maria Butina. See the red-haired woman there answering, uh, asking a question? Look, reading off her notes. That's Maria Butina. This was a conservative confab that happened in Las Vegas in the summer of 2015. The very first time any presidential candidate running in the 2016 election weighed in on the issue of Russian sanctions was when this red-haired woman, Maria Butina, walked up to a microphone at an audience Q&A thing with then-candidate Donald Trump, and she asked candidate Donald Trump about sanctions on Russia. And Trump responded with this long soliloquy about how he liked Vladimir Putin very much and he didn't think he would need the sanctions. And no, he was against U.S. sanctions on Russia. He'd get rid of them. And so that was July 2015, right? Very early on in the 2016 race. And of course, over time, the odd dynamic between Trump and Putin and Trump and Russia and the, the Trump campaign's secret discussions with Russia about dropping sanctions on them, I mean, that would all end up becoming a huge deal, right? It, it became such a big deal, we still haven't sorted it all out. It's, we're still not over it. But the very first time the whole idea of Russia sanctions came up in the campaign for any candidate, it was through that question at that conservative confab in Las Vegas in July 2015, a question from the floor for candidate Trump that elicits this statement from him, I am against the U.S. government having sanctions on Russia. And it turns out that woman who asked that question, who injected the whole Russia sanctions thing in the campaign in the first place, turns out she would later be indicted as a secret foreign agent running an influence operation in this country on behalf of the Russian Federation. The Maria Butina story is just nuts, right? 
I mean, when she was ultimately arrested and indicted and put in jail, she was described by prosecutors as a secret agent, basically working on behalf of the Russian government, regularly reporting home to her Kremlin handler about how things were going and her efforts to make contacts and meet influential people inside the Republican Party, particularly uh, through conservative organizations like the NRA. But in the charging documents, in her case, in an FBI affidavit filed with the court, the government also described a different person who was involved in the scheme, a person who was named by prosecutors as U.S. Person One. And if you piece it together through various documents and reporting, U.S. Person One in the Butina case appears to be her American boyfriend, um, who according to the government, worked closely with her throughout the duration of her influence operation to try to influence the Republican Party in a way that would, quote, advance the interests of the Russian Federation. There's also just been a ton of public-facing reporting about uh, Maria Butina and her American boyfriend, um, including this seminal New York Times piece, which broke the news that Paul Erickson, the boyfriend, um, had, during the campaign in May 2016, he had sent the Trump campaign an email that literally had the subject line, Kremlin Connection. <laughs> he was offering in that email to set up a connection to Donald Trump um, with, an, with an emissary from Vladimir Putin's office. He said he could set Donald Trump up in a meeting with somebody who was sent as an emissary from Putin, and he could do it at an upcoming NRA event. So... I mean, today, Maria Butina is still in jail. Uh, she pled guilty. It's expected that she's going to be deported back to Russia as soon as she finally gets released from prison. Uh, her boyfriend, U.S. Person One in the Butina case, according to prosecutors, he helped her throughout with her illegal influence operation that she was running here on behalf of the Russian government. Uh, he has, meanwhile, been indicted himself on financial fraud charges in his home state of South Dakota. He's facing federal charges there. He's pled not guilty. He's awaiting trial. But the saga of those two, right, the, the story of these two, even before their indictments, it's been like the, you know, the, the made-for-TV, technicolor, spy movie, dramatic subplot um, in this whole scandal and the whole investigation and all of it, right? I mean, all, all of the stuff around the Russia scandal is interesting to a certain degree. It's all incredible, right, that we're looking at Russian influence in a U.S. election and potential leverage over the campaign and the candidate. And I mean, it's... It's all pretty cinematic, pretty cinematic. But when it comes to Maria Butina and Paul Erickson, her American boyfriend, I mean, that's the stuff that definitely makes like the trailer for the movie, right? I mean, what are all these Russians doing with the NRA? And why did all those NRA people end up in Moscow at the same time that Mike Flynn was there doing that gala dinner celebrating the Russian propaganda TV channel where he sat with Vladimir Putin? And is that Jill Stein, the Green Party candidate there too? What? <laughs> I mean... Maria Butina literally sends a message to her Kremlin handler the night that Trump gets elected. She says, I am ready for further orders. <laughs> then she immediately sends word to her handler um, that she has heard that a specific person is going to be nominated by Trump to be Secretary of State. And she sends word of who that person is because she tells her handler, basically, our people in Russia should have a heads up about that choice. The Russian government's opinion on that choice will be taken into consideration. So please, you know, circulate the name and let me know what I should tell people here about it. I mean, this is crazy stuff. The Russian government being consulted on who Trump's going to pick as Secretary of State? What? I mean, the Butina and Erickson stuff is the most kind of sparky, most lurid, and therefore, I think, some of the most heavily covered part of this the whole scandal. Well, Josh Rogan at The Washington Post uh, reports tonight that Maria Butina also turned up at the wedding of Mike Pence's national security advisor. What? Yeah, this was June 2017. Mike Pence's national security advisor, a woman named Andrea Thompson, she got married that summer of 2017, first summer of the Trump administration, uh, right? She's got that awesome new job. She's getting married. Maria Butina was at the wedding. And why was Maria Butina at that wedding? Because U.S. person one, her boyfriend, Paul Erickson, he was officiating the wedding. Oh, it also turns out that the man who, Mike Pence's national security advisor, the man who Andrea Thompson was marrying at their wedding that day, uh, he had recently given Paul Erickson $100,000. 
Now, just quick looky-loo looky at the timeline here, right? Trump administration comes into office beginning of 2017. The summer of 2017, Vice President Pence's national security advisor gets married and her wedding is officiated by Maria Butina's boyfriend. By the end of 2017, there's these news reports about Maria Butina and her boyfriend, including her boyfriend offering to be the Kremlin connection, setting up secret back channel meetings for Trump with people from Putin's office. I mean, this news is like the front page of the New York Times in December 2017. December 2017, that's the front page of the Times. Thereafter, in the spring of 2018, Mike Pence's national security advisor gets put up for a big new job. And so the Senate holds confirmation hearings for her to decide whether Andrea Thompson will become the new U.S. Undersecretary of State for Arms Control and International Security Affairs. She goes through that whole confirmation process in the spring of 2018, knowing that her new husband had given $100,000 to Maria Butina's boyfriend, and Maria Butina's boyfriend officiated their wedding, and he has since been named as one of the people secretly trying to set up the back channels between Putin and Trump that by then were widely understood, widely known to be the subject of a major FBI inquiry, the special counsel's investigation, a whole country having its hair on fire over what happened between Trump and Russia during the campaign, and what were guys like Maria Butina's boyfriend doing during the campaign, offering to set up all these secret back channels to the Kremlin? Why would a campaign need that? I mean, she knew all of that when she was being put up for this top job at the Department of State, going up for Senate confirmation. But apparently none of it came up, did not mention it. None of the senators who voted on her confirmation had any idea of any of that because she didn't say and nobody told them. Well, do you want to know what that job she was up for is really like? What you actually have to do on a day-to-day -day basis, if you, in fact, are Senate confirmed, as she was, to be Under Secretary of State for Arms Control and International Security Affairs, you wanna know what that job actually is, what you actually do when you have that job? You negotiate with Russia. You negotiate with the Russians on arms control treaties. That's your job. So Josh Rogan spoke with a senior Trump administration official in response to this scoop today. Uh, that senior administration official told Mr. Rogan, quote, when the person, marries, the person who marries you gets into trouble with the Russians and your job is to negotiate with the Russians, you have to disclose that. Everybody with an intelligence clearance knows that. But as Josh Rogan reports today at The Post, not only did Andrea Thompson not report any of this stuff to the Senate when she was up for confirmation to be the top U.S. arms control negotiator with Moscow, not only did she not disclose it when she was up for that job, she's never disclosed it to anyone inside the government. According to three administration officials, quote, uh, Thompson never disclosed these ties to her superiors until approached this week by this columnist. So that's what's going on in the Trump administration tonight. I mean, we're trying to get our heads around new and unprecedented stuff from them all the time, but it is remarkable, right? I mean, now in the space of 24 hours, we've got these twin revelations that the guy who they had working as acting defense secretary for the last six months, he, the whole time, was sitting on an incredibly potent, disturbing family secret that he was trying desperately to keep anyone from knowing about while he was running the Pentagon. That is a national security intelligence risk in terms of his vulnerability to blackmail and leverage. That is almost impossible to overstate. Now tonight, you can add to that, the chief high-ranking official negotiating on arms issues with Russia had a really big Russia-related secret that she had been sitting on as well, not disclosing it to her superiors, not disclosing it apparently to the FBI for her background checks or her clearances. We can surmise that because it was not disclosed apparently to the Senate when they voted to confirm her to this post more than a year ago. I mean, that's, this, this is like a plot you would invent in a shiny cover airport, novel, airport spy novel, right? I mean, you know, high-level US government negotiators secretly linked to Russia's undercover agent. <laughs> Russia knows it. But the American public doesn't. What can Russia do with this information now that they've got this top official over a barrel as they're heading into arms negotiations and they know that she knows and... I mean, it's just insane. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.